Hello, and welcome to Student Affairs Now. I'm your host, Keith Edwards. Today is a special treat as I get to interview one of my Student Affairs mentors and heroes, Dr. Susan Komovitz. We'll learn about her career, her thinking, her predictions for the future, and I'm so excited you agreed to do this, Susan. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and learning committee for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We hope you'll find these conversations make a contribution to the field and are restorative to the profession. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find us at studentaffairsnow.com or on Twitter. We also have our first sponsor today. Stylus Publishing is proud to be a sponsor for the Student Affairs Now podcast. Browse Stylus' student affairs, diversity, and professional development titles at styluspub.com. Use their promo code SANOW for 30% off all books plus free shipping. You can find Stylus on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter at Stylus Pub. As I mentioned, I'm your host, Keith Edwards. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a speaker, consultant, and coach. You can find out lots more about me at studentaffairs.com. I'm hosting this conversation today from Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is the ancestral home of the Dakota and Ojibwe peoples. Now, on to today's conversation. Uh, Susan, you are a student affairs legend. I know that you're a student affairs legend because one of my student affairs claims to fame was that I was in the back seat of your car the very first time you got pulled over for a speeding ticket. I believe, is that true? That's true. That is true. I was so elated. I was so sorry, sorry you got pulled over, but I, when I found out it was the first time in your life, I thought, this is the story I'll get to tell introducing Susan at some point. And I believe this is the second time I've gotten a chance to do that. So thank you. We have for many other stories, Keith. <laughs> yes, we, we'll get to some of those, but this is this is a fun okay. one for me to kick things off with. Um, but, but you are a legend in student affairs. You got your undergraduate from Florida State University. And a year later, you had your master's uh, and four years later, at the age of 27, you had your EDD from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, all while working in residence life and getting promoted twice. You then worked at Denison University, and then four years after finishing your doctorate, you were already a VP at Stevens College in Missouri, and then later a VP at the University of Tampa. I'm just, I'm, I'm impressed, uh, a little envious at this very quick push through both education and professional career at the same time. Uh, and also given the time in our culture, I imagine uh, that was quite complicated. What was it like for you to rise so quickly through both your education and institutional leadership and student affairs at that time? Well, it, it was exciting and complicated as you've uh, alluded to. Let me start though and say my pronouns are she, her and hers. And I am just living outside of Tampa in the ancestral area for Tokabanga and Pahoy. Uh, Indians that I knew nothing about. I grew up in Florida and did not know their history. Uh, later, these became Seminole Indian regions, and we did know that history. So um, it's nice to see the depth of those histories in the lands that we're in. And you used Thank the you word legend. Really, you know, I think of legend as like Liberty Valance or um, I don't know. I, I mean, folklore and and ballads that people sing. And, and then I realized, you know, if you've been around for a long time, this is my fifty-first year in doing student affairs work in some form or other, although I'm now retired. Um, but it's been an exciting career and it sure got a jump start it, in those times and the times made a lot of difference. Um, being involved so early meant a lot happened quickly. I'm the oldest of the baby boomer generation. So we were this big group of college students in 1964 coming out of high school and coming off to college. And I mean, massive numbers of people that hadn't happened in big ways since the GI Bill probably up to that point. And so, uh, and society then was changing very quickly. Uh, major cultural changes in the 60s and early 70s, the black power movement, all the civil rights changes, um, the Vietnam War, uh, challenges to gender roles, the women's movement happening. And it was really exciting to be alive and experiencing as well as working toward uh, much of that kind of change. I have to say too, when, I, when you make me think back to the Florida State College years, there's no doubt about it that for me, the big difference for me in those years was having grown up with such supportive parents. My mom and dad were phenomenally supportive and uh, made sure I was highly engaged in high school. They never went to college. They were uh, both in the Navy during World War II. And my mother even got a medical discharge to have me. So mm -hmm. this um, role they played in knowing 
exactly how important education was and um, somehow even for, for young women, for girls in that era, the need for self-confidence. Um, I always assumed, even through high school, that I was where I, that I was supposed to be there, wherever there was, and that my voice should be heard, and that I had something to say. And I mean, my parents did that with dining room conversations at the dinner table, and those things matter a lot fam to families, of course, all the time. But I was very, very privileged to have my mom and dad both encouraging that, and to make sure that we were, my brother and I were active parts of the communities that we were in that we had a responsibility to try to make things better, at least at some point. So I benefited a lot from the societal changes because people were looking to give women um, more role and more visibility and more equity. And I was there at a time with good degrees and uh, interested in being involved in that happened. I, I think for me um, professionally, probably several threads started to roll together for me. One was that I really loved learning and Melvin Hardy's master's program was an exciting place to be. She was a mover and shaker and we learned from how she was as well as what we learned from her. But it's interesting that that summer that I graduated and started my first job as an area coordinator at Tennessee was when Chickering came out with education and identity. So we never even had that book in grad school. Mm -hmm. If you and I realized very quickly, if you were going to stay learning, you'd have to. That's the way you would keep up with the field, and eventually maybe even shape a field. But at that point, it was oh, we better be bringing this book into the hall director professional development program because we're all going to want to know these vectors. And look how that's changed our professional world and our professional life. Shortly after that, Lee Knefel Camp and Carol Weidick and others wrote um, um, a book that advanced Bill Perry's work on moral, ethical, and cognitive development. And we gobbled that up. And so I decided I really wanted to get my doctorate early on. And uh, that's enrolling at Tennessee in that doctoral program, which I then I was able to complete. But that love of learning and new literature coming out, new scholarship that guided where that learning should go made a huge difference for me. I think another difference that got made for me was the opportunities to be involved in real change. In that first three or four years of work, uh, which is a phenomenal thing to think about. I mean, change is always around us and we've got a lot of it happening right now. Right. And in another week, maybe even more of it one way or another happening. Mm -hmm. But um, in that three or four years, 18 year olds got the right to vote. So that meant those of us in housing no longer had a fiduciary responsibility only with our students, but it had to be something else. So it became contractual. So we were creating housing contracts and you'd go to a Kuho with figuring out how are you writing your contracts this year? And what did you need to put in them? And uh, we had Title IX happening of the um, Civil Rights Act and mm -hmm. that led to uh, statements about gender discrimination and honor societies and all kinds of student organizations went co-ed and that gave us a chance to uh, build a whole new way of co-education in organizations that didn't always exist. FERPA and the Buckley Amendment, um, Section 504 of the Vocational Re Rehabilitation Act. I learned lots about learning disabilities that I had never known before. So all of those things led to lots of administrative expansion. Administrations were growing rapidly in that era mm -hmm. because you had to oversee regulations as well as expand services. And so that was a big thread that started to wrap together. And then the third of these was professional involvement. I got involved mm -hmm. in ACPA um, in 1970 at the, my first convention. And, and fairly shortly after that, Phyllis Mabel got me active in the Commission on Residents life, residence education, we called it Commission Three. And I also started trying to pursue some interest in student leadership. I was always interested in how leadership developed. It became my dissertation topic in 1973. So right from that early era, I was reading leadership books and I was looking at leadership. Uh, but it also taught me in that era that if you wanna get things changed in a profession, you go through associations. So the associational involvement of ACPA later, NASPA, CAS, and some other things uh, made a huge difference. So those things came together in that era in a way that were really exciting, that there was more to learn and literature was coming out and I love learning mm -hmm. and that there was real change we could make and that associations and getting involved to make a difference um, really mattered. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that you love learning and I just remember I have so many memories of being in class with you and you being giddy and excited about 
what a student had brought in from another realm from their undergrad major, just so excited about that. I'm getting this image of you in your early career as someone who's seeing all this change around you and really inspired to make a difference. And then at the same time, gobbling up everything you could consume along the way to inform you uh, and help you lead better and lead this change better. Um, is, is that sort of resonating with you? Oh, yeah. And at that time, I think it was all Xeroxing articles and sending copies to people. And it got a whole lot easier when it could be PDFs. You know? <laughs> so I'm one that really has advantage by all the technological changes because I can send a link out to somebody. You should read this article. You'd love yes. it. You know, yes. And it, it, yes. that connecting people with ideas has always brought me so much energy. I just love knowing that I might have found something someone else uh, would love to see if they didn't already know about it or people will send me things saying they know I would love it. And that, right. that's a great way to learn. Yeah. Um, well, you mentioned ACPA and professional involvement in shaping uh, the profession and you were ACP, ACPA president in 1982. And I know there's a twist to this story. So why don't you tell us what it was like to lead ACPA in 1982 as president of the association? <laughs> yeah. and. And concurrently, what was even going on in my life at those times, which those two kind of are always, you know, right. for all of us. Uh, and it was a hard and exciting time in my own life. I was at Denison, till, Denison University until 1978. And my husband and I then, Mike and I, decided to divorce. And that's a hard thing for anyone to go mm -hmm. through. I'm sure there are listeners who have or ahead of them might even have that happen. But mm -hmm. um, you do come out of that. And you come out, to me at that point, it was terrifying to think of dating again at 32 mm -hmm. years old. Like, oh my goodness, that's another story. But um, <laughs> so I looked, I was looking at other positions to leave Denison and always looked at a faculty position. I always knew I loved ideas and learning and that process and um, accepted the position out at Stevens College as vice president and dean of student life, uh, which is wonderful. At that point, I was VP for commissions for ACPA and became member at large. But a year after being there, and people might not know Stevens College is a women's college, it still is. And how exciting to be at a feminist women's college in that era, where we were supposed to be helping women be empowered and seeing their role in the future. And that was a very, very exciting time. But a year after I'd been there, the art department hired a great guy called Ralph. They called me and said, we have an applicant for a job. His name is Ralph Comise. Do you know him? <laughs> uh, because he used to be at Denison and I didn't know him there, but I said, I know it's Comabess and he was very good here. And we got married about five months later, which is very exciting. But in January of 81, I found out I was pregnant. That was thrilling. Uh, and three days later, found out I won the election as president of ACPA. And it was like, sit back for a second and think, oh my goodness, how do you do both of those things, neither of which I'd ever been, a mother or right. a president of a national association. And to this day, I think the key thing I would say that made all that work and work so well was Ralph. That having the right partner in your life, the partner that thinks you're tremendous, that you can do it, go for it, that we are a team here and we'll make it work. And I mean, to have had Ralph behind me all that time, even to this day, uh, you know, Ralph's in here helping set up the lights and, you know, that, that, that support makes a big difference. But it was exciting, certainly personally, and to know that Jeffrey then was born when I was about to be president-elect of ACPA, and he's 39 now. It's like, <laughs> whoa, that was a long time ago. Uh, I think there's some lessons that come out of that experience of, ha of having big things happening in your life and but all of them taking serious responsibility. One of them was to set priorities that there are seasons for things. You don't do everything. Mm -hmm. For example, um, I didn't do hotel selections for ACPA for the convention coming up in three years. I thought, I don't care what the hotels look like. Someone else can do that because I don't have the time to travel now, but mm -hmm. that's a task others could do. My house was never clean in that era unless we paid somebody <laughs> to come in and do it. And that was a privilege that we could. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But there are things, all my plans died. I mean, they're just things that don't happen <laughs> while other things do happen. I think another lesson from that is, you know, people are always watching. The more you get into a visible role like you with these podcasts and your mm -hmm. work with um, uh, your consulting and your men's uh, and, and sexual violence work and all that you do, people are always looking at you and they were me. But I remember giving a couple speeches when I was very pregnant and I would stand up to go to the podium and the audience would gasp. There literally was a visible you could hear the intake mm -hmm. of breath. 
And then afterwards, I was flooded to the front of the stage with young people saying, can we talk to you about how you're doing this and going to be a mom or are a mom? And those things just weren't as visible in their lives. Uh, I think in that era, particularly in 81 or two, a lot of women who worked uh, either didn't have children or might not be in partnerships. And, and so it was a visible thing that caused a lot of people looking. So to remember that people are always looking to us and you are a role model for good or bad, even if you didn't want to be. Right. Uh, so that, that awareness of, uh, became very keen to me. And one of the important things to me was to realize, okay, I'm going to always talk about my family. Because one of the things that I think we need to role model in our lives is, is more balance and more wholeness. And people need to know about what's life like as a stepmother to Rachel and as a mother to baby Jeffrey. And, um, to, and so my students all knew my kids. You did. I mean, they saw mm -hmm. them grow up from little people to be the big people that they are. I think all those things are really important. Well, they, I, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because... Um, we have a few people who are who uh, chimed in about interviewing you. One of them is Larry Roper. Oh, and Larry Roper, who um, was the vice president, uh, vice provost for student affairs at Oregon State, a Maryland alum. Uh, he was the vice president at Oregon State for 20 years. And I asked him about you because I know you think so highly of him. And he said the thing that stands out about Susan is her love of family. And I never fully understood Susan until I met Ralph, until I met Jeff. And it put him in touch with your wisdom and your humanity. And so he said, I should ask you about that. Uh, that's nice. That's nice. Well, I have to tell a Larry Roper story too. Larry and I were the closing keynoters for ooh, NASPA in LA, in uh, New Orleans some year, whenever that year was. <laughs> and um, we were to draw themes out of what had happened. And he was reminded of Ellis, his son, uh, mm -hmm. as little children do, teaching him a lesson of something he observed. Oh, boy. And he said, sure. I, don't, I don't think I can say that. I said, you must say that. You must use Ellis as a story because that's going to connect to everybody out there, as well as young people who want to see that part of you. And so I think that's a good example of those things. I think Larry's tremendous, just tremendous. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's interesting. We don't seem whole maybe until we bring that family and those parts of it into it. So it's good that, that I'm, I'm proud that he said that. That's very good. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to say anything more about ACPA before we, we move on to, uh, your demotion? Um, well, I think what I would say it's tangential to ACPA is that when, that how important it is to have a work community that supports you to take on a role like ACPA president or to take on a role um in, in, in like a new parent uh, has to coming back to work after maternity leave or whatever means you've got to have people around you who truly know that we're supporting each other and it's your turn to be supported and i really give a lot of credit to stevens the president was phenomenal the associate uh, dean that worked with me is a dear friend to this day and she just stepped right in and did things she said don't you worry about this you be healthy in the hospital having that baby and we've got it covered you know it was like wonderful and how can we be that kind of person for other people becomes the modeling that that always did for me. That it, it's important to know that in seasons when we're too busy, others need to step up and help out and we do that for them too. Yeah, wonderful. Well, you were president of the Association for Student Affairs, ACPA. You were a two-time VP. And my guess is there were some inquiries about presidencies in there too. Um, but then you made the leap to a lowly assistant professor at the University of Maryland. What provoked this shift from these powerful leadership positions and some more possibilities to then becoming a faculty member and doing that work? Well, I, I signaled it probably by saying that I've always looked at a faculty job and each move, it, I've made several moves and in each of them, I would find out what faculty positions were open. I got offered one back in 78. But I decided I didn't know enough yet. You know, I thought as a faculty member, I should be old and wise and um, that I wasn't there yet. But I, that's always interested me. I did interview for a couple presidencies. I got nominated. The search firms were kind of new things in that era. And a search firm got a hold of my name from a nomination. And although I was a final semifinalist for that position and didn't receive it, 
um, they they had a hold of me at that point. So they mm -hmm. called me three months later and said, we have another contract we think you'd be perfect for. Would you be willing to look at this position? And I said, oh yeah, sure. Uh, so I interviewed for that and I was a finalist for that position. And I thought, I was 38 then. I thought, well, you know, this is gonna click. I, this well could happen for me. And then I thought, but do I want to do this? Um, I think one of the phenomena that happens to all of us is we, what, whoever your supervisor is in, particularly those of us working within higher ed institutions, mm -hmm. you have a supervisor or their boss, and you think I could do that job and probably better, you know, I could do that <laughs> job well. And so I could imagine doing it. And once I was a VP, I could imagine being a president. Um, I always like Rosabeth Moss Cantor's work. And she said, she wrote and said, success is something other than upward mobility. And I, you know, I certainly know that I felt very successful in what I was doing. I didn't need to be a president. Matter of fact, I'd probably never see Jeffrey grow up. You know, I would mm. be out trying to raise money to keep people fed in their mm. jobs uh, in small struggling liberal arts colleges. So decided I don't want to do that. Now, Ralph, in the meantime, had our, he was an, he's an artist and he had already planned the poetry readings we would have at the president's house on Sunday afternoons. You know, Ralph thought it'd be great uh, for me to yeah. be a college president and he could do all those things. Um, but that was fun. But it, it was clear to me that wasn't the direction to go. So I always did apply to faculty jobs. And I was going to be leaving the University of Tampa uh, because they dissolved the Division of Student Affairs. Mm. That's another story in itself. <laughs> happening to two people uh, these days and in mm -hmm. all times. Um, and I got a call from the search committee at Maryland and said, we have an assistant professor position open. Would you even consider it? And I said, I'd love to. So I got offered a VP job or two in that cycle of searching and the Maryland position. And I knew I'd have to go in and establish my, my scholarship and my research and those and needed to. I mean, mm -hmm. for the sake of students, you needed to show that you could do that work with them and guide mm -hmm. their work. And so, but I was always devoted to uh, Knevelkamp's model is practice the theory to practice. So I always loved practicing and then looking at what does that teach us about our work? And then how do we apply the best of that back to uh, practice like you all have done with your latest book. I mean, your book is just brilliant on this curriculum and uh, residence education or student affairs mm -hmm. in general about practice mm -hmm. the theory to practice. And I believed in that. I also knew that I wanted to research leadership. I really wanted to dig deep with how can we make better leaders out of our students. In the 80s, the books on student leadership, on leadership in general, were things like looking out for number one and winning through intimidation. It's like, mm -hmm. these are leadership books. Mm -hmm. You know, it had to be better than that. And I had been teaching leadership courses. So I knew that I wanted to do that. Um, I, I think a question for me was, did I wanna be a faculty? I haven't told this probably to anybody, but did I wanna be a faculty member in a one person program where it would be mine, you know, and I could really try to shape and, and do it or in a well-established program and thought, well, I really would like a well-established program. I'd like to work around colleagues who are just brilliant. Mm -hmm. And I knew that would elevate all of us even more. Right. And in this case, Mary Lou could teach me how to be a good faculty member and Bud and Drew and Dick and all the Maryland people were there to support our program. And it was gonna be a win-win. Uh, so I was thrilled to come. I, I think the, the uh, fascinating thing to me about all this, uh, people would ask me once I was there, so what's it like to be an assistant professor after having been a VP? And I said, well, I don't mind doing all the things you have to do to show your, as long as the salary would still support my family, fine with going and proving myself through a mm -hmm. tenure process. Uh, I, I, my VP suite at Tampa had a fireplace in my own bathroom, you know, like how do you, <laughs> and then at Maryland, I go to the Benjamin building and they cleaned out what was being used for brooms and put me That's in right. an office with it and had brooms, which, but you know, it didn't matter what mattered was it was a place to meet with students and uh, I do think the things I miss, though, we're having a secretary and we're having a staff to work with, because when you have ideas and you want to get with people and percolate ways to implement them, you need a staff. Eventually, I figured out that's what research committees could be, that research projects with students meant, boy, you get great ideas and together you right. play them out and you build them and they grow. And so I, I missed a secretary, particularly in the pre-computer days when, mm -hmm. I mean, pre-internet days when you had to set up a meeting send little pads of paper with, mm -hmm. fill out your time slots and send them back and we'll find time for me. You know, that stuff took up too much time. Right. So I miss somebody doing that um, on my behalf, 
Um, right. But I loved it. I, I did not mind at all starting as assistant professor. I learned a lot about how faculty is much harder work than I ever thought looking at it as a VP. And I'd been married to two faculty members. <laughs> so I thought I understood this, but it's all the time work. It's 24 seven, right. voice can't be turned off because you should be writing or editing in between loads of laundry. I'm thinking of the chapter I need to be working on or preparing a class lesson or it's all the time work, but it's thrilling to be at a place yeah. like Maryland is and was um, was just exciting every day. It was that conference high of going to work and knowing you're gonna just get great ideas and people are so generous and everybody cared for each other. You felt appreciated. Um, I know all work environments are not like that, but I feel very, very lucky all my career, for 25 years of my career to have been mm -hmm. at uh, that place with those people during those times. Mm -hmm. Well, I know they were very lucky to have you, and I know your office did get upgraded from a broom closet, but not that much. I mean, I, when I was there, you had a window. <laughs> I got a window. But, I eventually got a window. <laughs> yeah, but um, well, while, as a faculty member, you've you um, you proved yourself as a faculty member. You've written some of the most important texts in the student affairs profession, from and they're all on the bookshelf behind me. Exploring <laughs> leadership to contributing to the social change model of leadership, to student services, better known as the Green Book, um, to being a major contributor to the team that wrote Learning Reconsidered, to launching the multi-institutional study of leadership and leadership identity development model. As you look back now, what are the scholarly contributions that you're most proud of? And is uh, that overwhelming to even hear those? That's just the tip of the iceberg. It's almost like saying, which of your children do you love best? You know, you can't, no. <laughs> you can't answer that question. I do think there are two themes there you describe. One is advancing our profession. Mm -hmm. So it was always important for me to remember and people that, that I worked with to know that my job was to teach student affairs in higher education. And my work was to help us figure out the student experience and how we could enrich student success. And so projects like the Green Book, the Student Services Book. But the key thing was they're all done. Every single thing I've done has been in collaboration with others. Because mm -hmm. uh, you love to learn. You love to learn. I love to learn. And I think it's the best way to create new knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, I might have had some of the original ideas. Somebody else might have, and I joined them. But we built together some really wonderful, phenomenal, in some cases, projects. Um, the ones that advance the profession that you mentioned, like Learning Reconsidered and the Green Book with Doug Woodard and uh, CAS, you know, being in, the, uh, being in that whole body of wonderful people in CAS. And then the, the creating and advancing student leadership as a field, we, that we co-created a group of us uh, in practice and scholarship, uh, a whole field that now supports people who are called leadership educators mm -hmm. that didn't even use that, that title probably before. The generativity of that has been wonderful and probably the most exciting thing recently. I've been retired now, quote, Ralph says I'm failing retirement. You are <laughs> failing retirement. I know that for sure. <laughs> I've been retired eight years since 2012. Uh, but in 2013, uh, I pitched to Josie Bass an idea of creating a new directions for student leadership series because I really wanted to keep a, uh, keep a mechanism for scholarship flowing out into the field to keep advancing it as a field of study, as a field of practice. And they agreed to that. So our first issue came out in 2015. And so we're five years into that, 20 plus issues now of new directions for student leadership with terrific authors. It's very generative. I'm still teaching then again. I get to help new editors with how you edit a volume mm -hmm. like that, with what the issues are, if it's plagiarism with, you know, there's all kinds of things that come up. But it's been very, very exciting to work on that project with the wonderful Kathy Guthrie, which mm -hmm. keeps me very renewed and very connected. I know I'll have to give it up soon because it really is other people's time to take on those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and as much as I love doing it for, for how I feel about it, it, it you got to pass those things on so that that generativity uh, helps yeah. them all continue. Well, one of, one of my favorite memories of, of you is being at ACPA, I don't remember which ACPA it was, it was a relatively recent one, and you were up on stage in front of everybody for the opening, and I believe you were with Harry Cannon. And when you walked on stage and introduced yourself, Twitter was just a flurry with, that's how you say it. <laughs> how do you say your last name, Susan Comavez? And then also someone said, that's Susan Comavez? 
oh my goodness, I just met her in the bathroom. She was so nice. She was helping me with the button to my blouse. I had no idea who that's, that's who she was. Um, and, and there are stories after stories after stories. I was recently in a conversation and I mentioned your name and someone said, I have a Susan Comova story. And I said, I bet it ends with how normal and easy to connect with she was. And he said, absolutely it is. That's absolutely the story. So uh, we'll move to transition from your career to some of the, the things, but um, one of your mentees, John Dugan, uh, mm -hmm. let me know that um, his observation of you is that um, you have successfully mentored a wide range of people, a wide range of scholarly interests, a wide range of identities and perspectives. And his observation is whoever you're mentoring, whoever you're working with, you help make them better. And so how have you maximized so many different people? I hope every educator can say that. I have to tell <laughs> you that was a story. I was sitting in a table with Gary Hansen, my friend, I remember at one of the ACPA conferences in Atlanta, the diamond anniversary or something. And Esther Lloyd Jones was escorted to the stage. And I leaned over to Gary and I said, I thought she was dead. You know, mm -hmm. she and got to know her after that very well, because as a past ACPA president, when I then became ACPA president, we even had personal time together, which mm -hmm. was very special. But that whole thing of someone seems distant to you because you only see them on the stage or their name in the book. Uh, right. and, and that seems very different. Um, I hope everybody would have that said about them if they've been an educator or a teacher. I treasure John Dugan. I'm the president of his fan club. I mean, I learned so much <laughs> from John Dugan every day. I did learn from John Dugan. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think I, I really do think in my heart of hearts, I always believed in the student personnel point of view. When Mel Hardy had us read that for our master's class back in 1968, and I'm reading the student personnel point of view, and I'm thinking each person has dignity and worth. Each person deserves to develop their talents to the fullest. I thought that's what I want to do. That is why I'm going into this field. There's so much talent in women, and at that point, uh, black people and people of color, and so mm -hmm. much talent in people that's not getting developed. And we've got to do people bring that out in you, people who did it for me, I treasure, and we just have to do that. But I also think it connects to me being a lifelong learner, you know, this learning theme that's kind of evolving as we talk. I learn, I literally learn so much from each person. Every student advisee, everybody that sat in my office, um, students in class, they brought some context that I never thought of before. They, they thought of something in a way that made me sit back and go, whoa, I didn't even consider that, and I should have. Um, but this co-learning kind of thing that we, I had, I mean, I, I brought a lot and I know I taught a lot, but I hope they knew too how much I learned from them, particularly thesis and dissertation topics. People would want to do a master's thesis or a dissertation on something like gambling or on uh, sexual violence or on um, a population that I knew little about or a method that I didn't know at all. And I thought, well, it's a journey we're taking together and I can learn it. I'm smart, mm -hmm. I can learn it, we'll do it together. And it's gonna be important to me to learn this and, I, and you will help me learn mm -hmm. it. And so doing dissertations and thesis advising became probably one of the biggest joys in faculty life and being on dissertations and thesis, even particularly in other departments where they view things differently I was always amazed by the different words we use for the same phenomena, you know, where I would go, oh, that's self-efficacy, you know, but mm -hmm. that is the word they use for it. But right. I just, it was, it was always learning. So everybody uh, taught me things and everybody indeed is special and wonderful to me. I love Facebook. And when I look at Facebook and see somebody's face pop up, oh, whole legions of thoughts of things we've done together, or I learned from them or that I'm happy to see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it truly, truly is a joy. Yeah. Well, uh, another person who I know you look up to quite a bit, Denny Roberts, uh, uh, he, you know, these are all very accomplished people, but when you mention your name, they rush to share a little bit of nugget with you. And Denny Roberts uh, said that you make everyone who you interact with feel like they matter. And that's the thing that he was taking away. And how do you make everybody, and his question that he wanted me to ask you is, how do you replenish your reservoir of caring, mattering, compassion, and humility? How do you replace that when that gets pulled down? Um, wow. I, I think so highly of Denny. I could tell Denny's story oh. now too. And one was 
I mean, there's so many with the work he and I've done in student leadership. You know, we're like, used to be, we were kind of like the parents of student leadership development. Now we're the grandparents. Of student <laughs> uh, but I've known Denny since 1971 or two. I mean, we've known each other a long, long time. And, it, and to have shown up at my, I came to my retirement party at Maryland and there was Denny who had come from Qatar. He was on his way home, but he had made a plan to be there at my retirement. What a special thing that was to yeah. have a friend that, that did that and would do yeah. that. Uh, I do think uh, this question is interesting um, to me. You know, I started giving speeches um, off campus and nationally and, and internationally back, probably 79 was my first one. A Kuho asked me to be one of the keynoters for a Kuho in Vermont in the hottest summer ever, Vermont ever had. <laughs> in no air conditioning in the residence halls. I mean, it was like one of those experiences. Mm -hmm. But I've always done these speeches. And um, one of the versions of a speech I used to do was about personal well-being and how do we stay centered and have personal well-being. So I've always thought about it. It's always been important to me to try to be have some uh, commitment and balance to diverse things and try to do them well. But I used to ask the question, are you excited? Are you existing or are you exhausted? You know, which best describes yeah. you? and um, conclude with the idea that exhaustion might, is probably mental exhaustion that I hope not many people do experience. These days, that's a real risk. I mean, the yeah, anxiety and common. the exhaustion of, of our times, um, we all know what those are, lead to that risk. So, um, but my conclusion would be, I hope what most of us are is tired but excited. You know, so I am in, in me has always been an excited person that might be very fatigued. I mean, indeed, mm -hmm. I might get tired needing sleep or having too much to do. But I still, if you ask me, would you like to read this or would you want to be on? I go, oh, yeah, sure. I'd love to, but I can't. You know, I know mm -hmm. I'd love to do something, but I had to learn to say no to those. I actually taught assertiveness training in the programming we did at Denison when that was popular in the women's movement of the 70s was how do you say no without feeling guilty? How do you right. say, you know, I can't right now, but call me next year because I won't have this responsibility next year and I can take that one on. So how do you balance what you're doing and stay excited, but not exhausted? There, there were um, several posters I had on my wall my freshman year. I've even written about this. They asked me to write a piece on the, about campus anniversary a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And Ralph had recently, because he was going to throw them out, found a tube of old posters that had been in our basement. And they had been literally on my hall, on my walls at Reynolds Hall at Florida State University. But one of them was Benjamin Franklin saying that nothing was ever accomplished without enthusiasm. You know, and you really got to have a passion and an enthusiasm for the things that you take on. And if you don't feel that way about it, do less of it, give it to somebody else to do, mm -hmm. try to get rid of it. Um, the other was a poster by James Baldwin. I don't think as an 18 year old, I had any idea who James Baldwin was, but I liked the quote so much. And it was that not everything that's faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Mm -hmm. And that's the realist in me. You know, that's the person saying, call things like they are. Be realistic about how long it's going to take to get something done or how hard it will be for you to learn set structural equation modeling, or let's just be realistic, but go for it. So that enthusiastic realist has always served mm -hmm. me well as a combination. I later read some work by Jerry Edelwish, and I had the master's class always read a chapter on stages of burnout, because people can, you can get burned out easily. And mm -hmm. there is such a thing as situational burnout. Like I can love my residence life work, but hate RA selection every year because it goes on forever and takes everything out of me <laughs> and I don't like it. Um, but um, Edelwish talks about the first stage of burnout is enthusiasm, particularly if it's not tempered with realism. Because if you just think things are going to change because you tried or you submitted a bill to faculty senate or you uh, brought up a great idea, and nobody likes it. So then you're deflated. You, well, that, you, that doesn't help you. You've got to be realistic right. about it and say, I just want to share this idea. Maybe next year I'll bring it up again, you know, or maybe I'll get more people in on my on a coalition building process. But um, that idea of being an enthusiastic realist, I think, has really served me well uh, to mm -hmm. to do that. I. I, I think the compassion part, you use some wonderful words, or Denny used some wonderful Denny, words. Denny, Denny, yeah. I pre appreciate there. And I have to give great credit um, to the role of counseling in our profession. I was a math chemistry major as an undergrad. Mm -hmm. I didn't have these kinds of courses. I never even took a psychology course as an undergrad. Um, but I did get the counseling and helping skills courses in the master's program. And that 
focus on the other person, that concept about actively listening, Roger, Carl Rogers and all those things, that just opened up my world to the ways we can engage with each other more fruitfully. Now, I'm a major, and I'm, I believe in self-awareness too. I mean, I loved Myers-Briggs and we used it more previously than we seem to be now. But when I found out I was an ENTJ, I said, oh yes, that is me. And that extrovert in me has to always keep from talking and mm -hmm. really work at actively listening and engaging and advising. Help me do that. I mean, I love the advising role as a grad faculty member because one on one that was so critical. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, those are that I, I, I humility is um, I'm a really proud person. I am proud of my accomplishments, but I think the humility piece may be. I don't know what Denny would say or you would say, but is the is how important the processes are yeah. that we did things together. We did this with each other. We accomplished this. And that idea of I would never take credit for almost any of the things we've gone over as alone. I initiated many of them. I was the instigator for many of them, <laughs> but I couldn't have done a lot of them or right. most of them by myself or alone. And right. the, the third poster that was up on my wall my freshman year at Florida State was the Japanese proverb that no one, none of us is as smart as all of us. You know, that idea of truly believing, yes, I have a lot to bring and I want to be heard, but all of us have something to contribute and we need processes that bring those other voices. And so the, the bottom line for me always is to be build communities wherever you go, build communities of people who then can bring in those voices and can bring in different perspectives and make sure people are heard and are engaged, but community particularly healthy, thriving, challenging communities where you can take each other on. Or if somebody hears, you know what so-and-so said the other day, someone would say, I don't think that sounds like what they would have said, or you misunderstood, because you know each other that well to know your heart and your head and, and where we are with each other. So anyway, building communities then becomes really critical. We do these right. things together. Right, and I, I love the we, because because you, as you're mentioning, you you are proud and you are humble at the same time, those are not in conflict, right? And it's not a false humility where you pretend, oh, me and not me, I haven't done anything. But you are proud, but you also recognize it, it wasn't all with you. I just want to, and the learner, right? You just love to learn. You love learning about other people. You love learning about other things. You're just so curious. Um, I want to quickly, as we move to, you know, we I know we were going to run out of time, uh, is to get you to look back quickly and then get you to look forward. So one thing John Dugan said is that you were very moved by Sandy Aston's response when he was asked what he knows now that he wished he knew earlier in his career. And he said it was uh, evoked quite a moment for you. So I'm wondering um, what might you, what do you know now that you wish you would have known earlier in your career? Wow, that's a great question. I haven't, I, um, I wish I knew about Gee, I think of all the things I still wish I knew about or <laughs> the latest three or four books that I just bought, or you know, it's like I'm still learning. But I, I, I think I wish I knew about institutional oppression. I don't think that I knew that term until well, certainly in the last 15 years or so. But this idea of how do we make sure that we're changing systems and structures in ways that bring that voice of everyone in? How, do, how are those closing down? opportunities and certainly learned that through being an ally and through experiences with the LGBTQ movement as well as Black Lives Matter and before we weren't calling it that but with Black mm -hmm. students being involved on campus so this whole idea about how do we design and redesign and remove uh, and substitute structures and systems and policies and new ways of questioning everything we do to say who is this going to oppress and not lift up. I mean, how can everything be done to lift up instead of keep down, which too many systems do. So I think if I had known that length, and, we, and I just didn't, I mean, sure somebody did. I didn't know that in 51 years ago as my career was starting, although we were challenging those systems, but we didn't talk about it in that way to give us a handle on it. My friend, Rochelle Pope, in her work on multicultural organization development, along with Bailey Jackson, her professor and others, really resonated with me. I started using that in readings in my classes um, for the master's students back you know, 20 years ago when they first came out because it started getting at how do we change the structures and systems? Mm -hmm. Well, uh... We're, for our last question, this is we called this podcast Student Affairs Now. 
And so we'd love to hear what you're thinking about now. And Julie Owen, who also chimed in on some of this, um, who was just gleeful at another opportunity for your gifts to be shared with the world, uh, said that you're a futurist. And as a futurist, and I know this about you, and she reminded me, um, this is a time of such uncertainty and complexity. Um, I'm wondering, what do you see for the future of student affairs in higher education? Well, that's great. At least that's a good question, Julie. Could Julie knows a lot about me that she could have asked about. But... She was very kind and very generous. Yes, <laughs> and very generous. Um, I I always did like studying the future. You know, I I do think that there are ways to do that, and uh, I wish I had done more of that. But in, in some of the early futures work that I used to do, I learned that some ways to look at the future would be a principle of analogy or use a principle of continuity. So a principle mm -hmm. of analogy in futurism would be to say, if something happens, then what's going to happen? Like if there's a recession, then more people go back to higher education to get retraining or new jobs. Okay, so there's an if then component. Mm -hmm. So um, we've learned if there is a deadly pa pa pandemic illness going around, then we must be concerned about safety in all human interactions. And what does that mean about our work? You know, so this if then the pandemic would be an analogy. If there's civil unrest, then there's going to be college unrest on the same human topics that civil unrest might create. So, and we can see all of those play out. Principle of continuity says something like if you have more of something, how do you keep having more of it or how does it shape everything else you do? So we now have, because of a uh, move to online learning and um, cyber instruction, uh, we're going to keep having more online learning. People have liked big parts of it. They're seeing how it really can be useful. We've changed some of the ways we interact. You and I were on a wonderful birthday call with 80 people and one person. And we mm -hmm. learned how we can do that kind of thing effectively. So there will be uh, more online services we need to be delivering. And in student affairs, we should learn how to do that then better. Um, we, if there are smaller numbers in residence halls or being on campus, we're gonna have employment issues. So there'll be people laid off. We won't be having the numbers in employment. Uh, the institutions that were in trouble before the pandemic in 2019 are the ones that are in worse trouble right now. Mm -hmm. That's a continuity principle. There aren't too many that'll be new in that group. There'll be some, but they, mm -hmm. and that equity and social justice issues continue to be and now have taken on new forms and new shape, including institutional oppression that we need to address. So. Uh, safety, how do we stay open and stay safe? How do we not put student affairs people who are and, and other essential workers into life-threatening situations that we certainly have to deal with? Uh, how do we create online experiences for belonging, for delivering services? I think we have a lot to learn still from the people doing distance learning work. They've been in it for years, University of Maryland, University College, Washington State. I mean, there are places that have had online programs for a long, long time doing online advising, online courses, online programming, online pushing podcasts out to their mm -hmm. students of, of famous speakers. I mean, getting other ideas out to them. NASPA's new book on online engagement, which is edited by one of our Maryland students at one point in her life. But we've, got, we've all got to re-educate ourselves around all that. And I think probably one of the key ones is around um, uh, how do we get our institutions doing effective diversity, inclusion, diver uh, institutional oppression, challenging kind of education? Um, I have been shocked to see few institutions speaking out against the president's comment to remove diversity training and calling it something even insidious instead of a solution to some of the problems that we're facing. So yeah. we need to speak up about that and do that. I am worried about higher ed in some general ways. One is the death of tenure. I think we're looking ahead at the future of tenure being no longer viable. Um, partly we're seeing it out of the challenges of freedom of speech. We should be standing up for faculty who do freedom of speech things, even if we don't like what they're saying, because freedom of speech is essential for inquiry, discovery of knowledge, pushing the boundaries of knowing, and we can't be silent about that. We need to find ways to do that. I also think we're gonna see whole program elimination. University of South Florida here in Tampa 
just eliminated their undergraduate college of education. And you just can't niggle away at a budget and cut everybody 30% and have much of anything left over. You're gonna to have to say, we're just no longer gonna be doing these sports. We're no longer do this activity. We'll no longer have these majors. And then we need to help find ways that students survive that, get their degrees met, transition in that, as well as look at our own work. My friend Nora Moore, who used to be the VP at Mizzou, used to tell his staff every year, I'm gonna ask you to do a lot of new things this year, but I want you to have a going out of business list. What things will you tell me you can no longer do if I ask you to do these new things? What things can others do that your office shouldn't be doing? But always figure out what you can do differently give it to student groups to handle, not do it at all. Uh, we just always need to know which things are not worth our time or have the impact we'd like them to have and not just keep taking on more, 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 more and right. getting ourselves sicker, sicker, sicker. So I would challenge student affairs people to think about that going out of business list kind of concept. Yeah. Um, and there are more things I would say too, but I think that there'll always be a need for student affairs people. There's always going to be admissions, housing, food, financial aid, counseling needs. There'll just always be things that student affairs people are prepared for, uh, know how to help their institutions handle. Um, some of the things may go away on the edges, at least partly, uh, mm -hmm. but, but how do we do all this work um, and lead our institutions? out of these very shocking times? How do we be the people that help lead institutions on designing the student experience for the future? Yeah, I really appreciate that. And it really, I really resonate with this idea of what are we gonna let go of? Because I think student affairs folks don't do a very good job at that. We're really good at what we're gonna add and these new innovation and, and new innovative ideas, but not so much what we're gonna let go of. I, I say we're, we're very good at bit entrepreneurial, but not good at, at being editorial. So that's something we can continue to work on. Um, I want to thank my uh, co-conspirators in this, John Dugan, Danny Roberts, Julie Owen, Larry Roper, and others. Thanks for having some little nuggets for Susan. Susan, I'm so grateful for you and your time and your generosity today, sharing all of this with our listeners on Student Affairs Now. Uh, it was one of the things I wanted to do uh, in this new podcast is have some one-on-one -on -one conversations. And so thank you for doing this. Uh, to our listeners, you can receive reminders about this and other episodes by subscribing to the Student Affairs Now newsletter or browse our archives at studentaffairsnow.com. We want to thank our sponsor, Stylus, for sponsoring this episode. And please subscribe to the podcast, invite others to subscribe, share on social, or leave a five-star review. It really helps conversations like this reach more folks and build the community so we can continue to make this free for you. Again, I'm Keith Edwards. Thanks again for our fabulous guest today and everyone who is watching and listening. Make it a great week. Thank you, Susan. Thank you.